Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the 2020 MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, day one. My name is Colby Smith. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. It's my honor to introduce the following panel, Changing Sports Beyond Ownership. This panel is part of the business track by Ticketmaster. Our panelists, going from your left to your right, are Mitch Lasky, co-owner, LAFC, Scott O'Neill, CEO, Paris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment, Wick Grausbeck, lead owner and governor of your hometown Boston Celtics, and this panel is moderated by Warren Zola, executive director of the Boston College Chief Executives Club. This panel will run for 45 minutes, followed by a 10-minute Q&A. If you'd like to submit questions for our panelists, you can do so on Twitter using the hashtag Beyond Ownership. At the end of the 45 minutes, the Twitter comments with the most interactions will be asked to the panelists. And with that, I'll pass it off to Warren. Thank you very much and uh, welcome. Thank you again to the organizers, the students at uh, MIT Sloan, to Jess and Daryl, and certainly to our panelists who have given up their time to join us today uh, to talk about changing sports beyond ownership. Uh, each of them have varied backgrounds, different sports, different um, perspectives, and so I think we're going to have a lively discussion. The first question I'm going to ask, though, I think we'll, we'll put this in context, and I'll, I'm going to start with Mitch. It's, a, it's an easy question. What brings you to our stage? It's a, it's a great story, and we'll just start with that one. So, yeah, it's a, I have a, sort of a unique path to being an owner, a sports owner, and that is that I was a Sloan nerd. So I started off uh, about 10 years ago coming here really as a fan um, and starting to hang out with the soccer analysts who were incredibly generous <clears throat> with me and tolerated my stupid questions and, and allowed me to hang out with them. And over the years, I sort of learned from the culture around here, like, a lot about the sports business, and an opportunity arose in 2015 when a friend of mine asked me if I would come in to LAFC when they had just hired their new general manager and, and give him a little presentation about the current trends in, in soccer analytics. And so I came in, spent a half, it was supposed to spend a half an hour, we went like an hour and a half, two hours, and at the end of the meeting, they invited me to join the ownership group. So I owe Daryl and Jessica quite a bit, and I'm, I'm kind of here because of them in some way. That's, that's great. So we've got some, some future team owners out there in the audience taking notes and uh, preparing to be on stage in, in, the, in the future. So um, before we look into the, into the future, I wanted to, to look back. You, all of you have been in, in the industry for a while. Just starting with what's sort of the biggest change in the evolution of sports in the past 10 or 15 years that, that changes your team, your organization, your thinking about the industry itself? Um, Scott, go ahead. Yeah, sure, I'll go. So, um um, you know, I've been in this business for 25 plus years, and um, first coming in, it was a, a very mom and pop dry cleaner type business, and, um, and it's changed dramatically. Um, in the last 10 years, I'd say talent for one, there, there are smarter people buying the teams and more talented people coming in to run them, so that's certainly changed. Um, the emphasis on data and content is dramatically different. Uh, I, th I think those are the two foundational building blocks that will determine the ultimate success or failure of organizations going forward. And, and the third thing is diversity. I think we've seen uh, women emerge into executive positions that you wouldn't have seen 10 years ago. So those would be my, my big four. And, and, and we'll come back to diversity because as we look at this panel, clearly there's not a lot up here as we talk about, about ownership now. But, but Wick, in, in terms of changes that you've seen during your time, in the industry with the Celtics and, and just in the business? It seems to me that uh, when I came in, I think looking across the pro sports in the United States, there were a lot of teams that were owned as a family business from back in the day. And it's turned into, uh, and we had a group, I'm very fortunate to have my group of partners who came in uh, with me, and that's the new model. There are people that can write these big checks, but there are also lots of groups being formed. And everybody's completely fixated and focused on winning as opposed to running the teams for a, more of a bottom line, I think, profit. And I see, so I think that it's really more, much more competitive in the league and in all the leagues now because everybody's really uh, sort of not focused on paying the bills, uh, you know, for an extended family, but actually just driving the team to a championship if they possibly can. 
Which, which is interesting because there seems to be more money coming into the sport right. as media rights deals change. So as there's more, there's more money coming in, you still think they're more competitive about trying to get that win for the team, for the championship. I just use uh, my friend Steve Ballmer as an example. I don't want to speak behind his back. He's not here or whatever, but, you know, but only in the most complimentary terms. Steve came in, allocated a, a piece of his assets to the Clippers. It might make some financial sense or, or whatever. I think it was a good buy. But he did it solely, really, to, to put the team on the court and try to win and then do the things in the community that you can do. He's just obsessed with that. He loves it. It's the way I like to try to think of myself as being a controlling owner. I know Scott's the same way in his team and Mitch. Um, you know, it's about winning and doing the right thing and being off the court. But it's really not about the income statement so much. Mitch, have you found that in, in Major League Soccer as well? I, I don't have the, the sort of longevity that these gentlemen have in, in the sports, but yeah, I think the, the presence of sort of ownership groups is on the rise for us as well, where we're seeing kind of eclectic collections of individuals, some with deep pockets, some with who can bring other skills, media, marketing, et cetera, to the table. So you look at the LAFC ownership group and there's a handful of, of sort of financial people, but there's also Mia Hamm and uh, Will Ferrell and Magic Johnson and a number of others who bring their star power to the, to the table and, in, and really kind of elevate the whole project. So I think that's an interesting trend that, that, that I think we're seeing as, uh, you know, more broadly in Major League Soccer. Um, and, you know, again, a retreat from these sort of family individual groups that, I mean, you think about the league in the very beginning, it was, you know, the Ann Schultz's, Lamar Hunt, and, and the Crafts basically owned the whole league. Mm -hmm. And, you know, today it's a much more diverse group of, of people running these teams. I think you've also seen, um, you know, you can see it with Wick, what he's, what he's built, even though his fund is, is separate, he's, he's kind of leveraged his celebrity, if you will, business celebrity, and his acumen and his knowledge of the business to build a really successful fund. And, and we, we've done the same um, with, a, with, a, with a small fund, you know, and we've acquired some other teams and some other assets and build a, you know, an innovation lab. And, you know, I think, you know, that and then the kind of the, the emergence of real estate around these, I mean, there's a whole world of community and businesses forming around these. So while well, I 100% agree with these guys, you're here to win. You know, but there's also a way to win by leveraging the incredible amount of passion and fan base and kind of interest to drive ancillary businesses. But I mean, yeah, Harris is interested in a bottom line as well, right? I mean, clearly winning is, is part of that and can feed that, but there's still a bottom line. There's still the revenue generation and the other ways to capitalize upon the team. It, it, you know, in our, our, I'm sure every organization is different. Like, it is about winning. I mean, WIC, WIC is 100% right. That's what we spend a lot of time on. And then we, we look to leverage the opportunity to build the business because I don't, I don't think they're at odds or in conflict at all. I think they're, they actually run really nicely in concert together. Yep. I remember, what was it, in 12, that first series we played against you guys when you guys had just all come in? It wasn't as fun. It was. <laughs> I remember it clearly. No, but... Uh, it, it was uh, so clear that you guys are in it to win it, and I have high confidence that you will um, because you're trying so hard and you're good every year now. And uh, anyway, that's what it's all about for those guys, I can assure you. But, but it is personal. Um, <clears throat> we've all experienced that. Like, it, it's, it's hard. Losing is hard, you know? Losing for an extended period is, is miserable. I went through that. And then, you know, losing when you're in a playoff series to get knocked out, um, it's very tough for the fans, and you feel for them. Um, but emotionally, you've put your heart and soul yep. into every second of your day, thinking about how you can improve, how you can get that edge, what deal might make sense. Um, it, it is, it's more draining than you could possibly it was, imagine. It was actually something I wasn't prepared for, to tell you the truth, was just that emo how emotional it really was. We got dumped out of the playoffs at, at home twice uh, in two, two consecutive years. Uh, last year, where we were the odds-on favorite to win an MLS Cup with the best record in the history of the league in the regular season, and it's gut-wrenching. I know. Um, in the old days, actually still now, after a win, I would go home and watch the game over. I couldn't sleep, and after a loss, I'd be so miserable I couldn't watch the game, but I couldn't sleep either, so I just <laughs> basically didn't sleep. I mean, the one message, I've been in 17, 18 years now, and the, really the message to anybody who's thinking of becoming an owner is you have to do it with enough capitalization, however you luckily get it, so that you can really just put it into the team because the fans will know if you're trying to serve two goals and well, we gotta pay the bills, but we're gonna do the best we can with the team. But you know, I mean, if it's too stressful and I'm lucky because of my partners, it's not me, it's the partnership, but that we can do it that way. Your Harris Blitzer is the same way. 
and uh, no doubt LAFC, but I mean, it's not okay to have these things and try to run them as anything other than a fan, because the fans will find out. And, and I think one of the things that we've all t talked about, I you know, grew up in Boston, I know that your passion for the Celtics as part of the fabric of this community, it's part of who Boston is, is, is thinking about the Celtics and their history. And so how do you make sure that your teams engage with the communities to make sure that you continue to build upon that so that we win and rise together? Mitch, I'll start yeah, with, with LA, because you got to... We had a really difficult uh, expansion problem, right? So we, we're starting a new franchise in Los Angeles, one of the most competitive sports marketplaces in the United States. There were seven successful franchises already operating. There was probably the most storied M MLS franchise, the, the LA Galaxy down in Carson, um, already present in our market. And Chivas USA, which had been the other MLS team in LA, had failed miserably. So it was a tall task. and and. There's no way you're going to get above the noise level with conventional marketing in Los Angeles. You're ahead of the Chargers, aren't you? Sorry? You're ahead of the Chargers? Uh, we're, we, I'm not going to well, get No, no, come on. Let's have a... The fans have come to see, to see a little bit of entertainment. Maybe a little bit. But, uh, Are you ahead of the Chargers? Probably, I think. Okay, good. So, um, there we go. But we, we managed to... You can tweet to, that. Oh, I mean, our, the way, the way we went about that. it was we basically, we, went, we started Sorry. doing meetups in sports bars and we started engaging with the fans almost in a one-on-one -on -one basis. And we brought a lot of the original early adopters kind of into the fold to kind of, the, the word they use around the club is to co-create with us, to help us with how we were going to design the stadium, how we were going to design the logo, how we were going to design the overall branding. And, and, it, and they just embraced us and it spread you know, to their friends and their friends' friends, and people brought other people to the matches, and it's an amazing in-person experience if you come to Los Angeles to one of the games. It's like going to a South American football game in terms of the, the sort of the crowd and the intensity, and, and I think it's infectious. Scott, how do, you, how, how do you make sure that the community is part of what you're doing and that you are integrating and, and making your community better? Yeah, I mean, for one thing, the, the world is very noisy right now and very divided. I mean, we curate our own social media. So we, we either kind of get Fox or CNN and, um, or both, and there's a lot of conflict. And people are trying to drive, the media members, which now are now total about 7.5 billion people, are kind of driving interest for likes or, or retweets or forwards. And the only way to do that is to kind of be on the cutting edge and be edgy. And I think sports is the, is the one place, one unifying force that b brings people together and gives us what we had when we were growing up, and that's a sense of community. You, you come to our games to, to be part of something special and to hug perfect strangers um, and to high five and sing and dance and cheer and, and boo if you're in Philadelphia. Um, and. And that's, that's the magic. What, what we do as an organization is when you come to, to work for our organization, you pledge 76 of hours of service. So you actually go and roll up your sleeves and go do something. Um, I don't care if you mentor, teach, coach, walk elderly people, which is uh, recently becoming me, across the street with a bad back, or, any, or, or help um, in a dog shelter. It doesn't really matter. Um, what I have been it, um, increasingly impressed with is the, the voice our players have. We have Kyle Palmieri, who's one of our star uh, wingers for the Devils, and he um, has a, a gala to raise money for the military. I love that. P.K. Subban has a Blue Line Buddies program where he brings um, kids from disadvantaged community to a hockey game. Um, when, there were, when there were fires raging in Australia, Ben Simmons gave money and then wrapped around our, um, a game to raise money. And so uh, the combination of an organization that has a, has a heart and, and players who are socially responsible, engaged, and committed, and it gives us an opportunity, I think, to make the world a little bit better. Well, I'll come back to player activism in a second, but, but Wick, with the Celtics in your investment into the Boston community, and, and everything that, that you're doing. That, that seems that's palpable for those of us who live here. Well, thank you. Uh, it's the players, it's the fans helping, it's every one of our sponsors signing up to our community programs. I think we led the NBA, or maybe we were tied with the Sixers, uh, I don't know, but I think we led the NBA in community appearances the last few years. It's something that we take pride in, um, and the players embrace it, and they know all about being a Celtic and what it means, and and um, anyway, it's the NBA in general. It's the other pro teams in Boston for sure. There's a good, you know, another thing is there's a community among the teams. We support each other's charity galas. We hang out together, um, you know, at every level of the organizations. We enjoy 
uh, hanging out. You know, Brad Stevens hangs out with Bill Belichick, two more disparate per personalities, except they're both just ruthless winners, uh, if you know, or doing everything they can to win. It's there's a lot of cross pollination that goes on in Boston sports, um, but there's a lot of community stuff that's just part of the deal. It's actually something I learned working at the NBA. Um, um, and I, I spent some time with Wick uh, when he, he was kind of newer on the scene and saw what he'd done. He runs an incredible gala. All his partners engage. I, I went to it one night. It was spectacular. Um, so that was one thing that I, always stuck with me. And I said, okay, I'm going to replicate that someday. And the, the second thing which I thought was really interesting was how they celebrate other sports teams. And if you, if you come to a game with the 76ers, you'll every, you, you will always find Flyers, Phillies, and Eagles at our game, and Union. And, and we celebrate them. And we celebrate their successes, and we do it on social media, and we do it with content. And together, kind of the whole city has, has come together because that's how the fans experience it. Yeah. And think of how tough that is for me because I run the Devils, mm -hmm. okay? And so we are literally having, you know, Claude Giroux, who's a terrific player for the Flyers, ring the bell, like our ceremonial bell to, to start a game. And so while that, that is difficult to see, yep. it's not about like me and how difficult it is for me. It's about, okay, how, what, what is, and it goes back to what I first said. It's like, this is a community. And there are a lot of cities where if you're an NFL fan, you cannot stand the basketball team or vice versa. I mean, and I, we're not going to name the cities, but uh, it, we don't want to have that. We could. Don't wanna ha we don't want to have that. No, no, no. We're five for five. You know, if, you, if you're in Philadelphia, you root for the Philly teams. That's how it works. Mitch, is, does LA have the, the same sort of environment, or are you finding no. that? No, I, you know, so we have some cross ownership with the Dodgers, and and um, obviously Magic uh, with the Lakers is, is is part of the group, and so um, we we've really integrated ourselves with the rest of the of the community there um, with the other sports teams. So we have a lot of you know. Dodgers on the sidelines. We have a falconer who brings our a bird out to to fly around the stadium and attack the the logo of the opposing team before the game. So, by the way, um, Scott is making a mental note: get falconer. Get falconer. <laughs> note, <laughs> note to self. And so we've had honorary Bad falconers mayonnaise. from from a lot of the local teams, from the Rams, from the um, from the Lakers, and, and and the like. And then you know you remember there's a lot of players now in particularly in baseball and in basketball, who come from countries where soccer is really the principal uh, viewed sport. And so we get, a lot of, we get a lot of just organic fans from the local, uh, from amongst the local sporting uh, people. So, so Scott, you, you touched a little bit about pl player activism and social media, right? So there's no doubt that many of the players have, have used social media to get their voice, their opinion, their message out to the masses. Is that good or bad for teams, ownership, leagues? I know that various leagues treat it differently. The NBA and, and Adam Silver behind his leadership certainly has treated that differently. Do you think that this is good in general? It's not without difficulty, mm -hmm. I can tell you that, but it's outstanding. It's outstanding for the world. Um, you know, as a, as a father of three daughters, there's nothing I think about more than raising young women who will grow up to try to, to, to put their resources to making the world better. And so when, when we have young men, and that's who we're, we're talking about, these are young men who in many ways are figuring it out. You know, we have 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds and, and 20-year-olds, and, and to, to, to take to, and leverage their celebrity and their appeal to lean into an issue and try to make it better, and I, I couldn't be more proud when our players take a stand. I think it's, it's wonderful. And I, I, think, I think you're right about the NBA. They take a lead, and I'm fortunate enough to work in the NHL as well very closely. And they're very supportive and out front. And there are two leagues that actually look, put their uh, front, like their, put their money where their mouth is, and say, "Okay, we're all in." And, um, and I think it's wonderful. It, I think it actually improves the, you know, the, the the sort of engagement with the fans as well. I think one of the most remarkable things, if you think about sort of the last five to ten years, is the effect that social media has really had in sort of, you know, breaking down the friction and boundaries between the players, the fans, the teams. Et cetera, and I think, uh, I mean, there's going to be obvious, you know, issues with that when when the fans are speaking in contradiction to the league or to the or to the team. But um, I think all, you know, on balance, it's it's been it's been a net tremendous benefit for sports in general to have that 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 collapse a bit. What are uh, shifting gears a little bit? What what are some of the key key factors that you think of that you need for success? in your business? Not, I understand the wins and the championships, but are there, are there key metrics or skills that you're thinking about that this is what we really need to embrace to, to ensure success within our organization? Um, uh, well, I know coming in, I guess, 17, 18 years ago, 
I felt like we didn't have a culture of, um, well, we had a culture of having 11,000 fans in an 18-6 arena. You can't really buy these things when they're down. I mean, when they're up in general, it's usually when things are going a little bit sideways. And so we had a lot to do. And so we, we tried to take an approach of, uh, you know, thanking every season ticket holder, talking to every season ticket holder, giving everybody, you know, email address, phone number. And there were so few season ticket holders that you could <laughs> talk to every one of them in detail at length. But I think the culture of connecting and being authentic, I, I'm not smart enough to figure out how to fool everybody. Um, so, you know, you got to set the goal right, which is to try to win Celtic pride on the court and off the court in the community, and then just live up to that. So that, I guess the, 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 probably the major success factor might be just authentically doing that and being able with the resources of my partnership and the fans and the sponsors and the media partners, you know, to be able to do that. So that's one. And then, then actually just really caring what people say, hearing them out, but then you got, at the end of the day, as an owner, you've got to make the decision that you think is right and you don't, it's not a debating society and you don't read all the columns and listen to all the sports radio and hear all the, read all the tweets and emails and then, you know, let the majority rule. You've got to make the call and then live with it. Mitch? Yeah, I mean, I, I came to sports really from a more traditional entertainment business background and, and it's kind of interesting how similar it is in terms of what the attributes of success seem to be, at least, you know, from my early, or my early look, and that is, you, know, you have very smart people around the table, both in the ownership group and in the management group, who really care about, like, the, about the club and, and, and where it lives in the world. You have a great product on the field, um, because ultimately we could do all the, all the, great, the best work we could possibly do, and if, if to Wick's point, we're not winning, um, we're, not, we're not pleasing people. Um, you need a, a you need a, a really passionate early adopter culture who's going who, who of fans and, and we have that in our supporter culture, um, and then you know finally you need sort of aspirational branding to to bring people in to attract people who maybe you know were th would think about coming to come to the stadium and re and really participate and and those four things I think are true across many many entertainment businesses. It's just remarkable how rare they are to have them all happen at the same time in the same place. And so, I, I, to me, those are the keys. Scott, are there, are there things that you, you say, absolutely, this, this is what, what we need for success? For me, it's culture and talent. Um, and, um, and some people get those two confused and say talent and culture. And I think if you have a, a culture, I, I, I'd, I'd steal from both of these guys, articulated it really well, but you need a culture, certainly of accountability and transparency. One where you're building a family, you need diversity of thought and ideas for sure. Um, and then you need the, the necessary talent to be able to, to lift you up. When, when you think about professional sports, I think two of the, the biggest questions that are, are facing leagues, one is how you divide the pie and, and the, the revenue that's coming in with the players, and maybe we'll come back to that, but, but the other one is how you grow the pie, right? How do you increase revenue streams so that everyone can enjoy the, the fruits of, of, of the league and the, and the labor? And, Media rights deals are, are changing sort of on a daily basis, it almost feels like. How, how are those changes in the, the media rights deals, what are they going to look like in the future, and how is that going to impact sort of growing this, this pie? Mitch, you're nodding your head, so I'll start yeah, with you. I mean, again, coming from the media side, I would say that, that um, I mean, we've seen over the last five to ten years an utter collapse of cable television viewership amongst 18 to 35-year-olds. It's, un, it's unprecedented, actually. Um, the, the number of, of young people who are willing to watch a complete game, um, a complete sporting game on television is, has, has dwindled. I think one of the advantages soccer has is that it's like a fixed two hours um, and, and it's not you know, like a, these endless baseball games that, that, that go on for four, four and a half hours. So I think that's a, an advantage we may have. It's also tweet worthy. Um, so, uh, and, and it's tweet worthy and like, and again, it's, you know, it's, it's more of a highlight culture. It's more of a, of a social media driven culture. It's more of a, a, a quick hit, uh, kind of media culture. And I think all of those things are going to make it very interesting going forward because I think a lot of these sports have really been driven by the, the sort of fat media deals of that, that flowed from cable because the cable bundle was such an important uh, thing to maintain for the companies. And so as that starts to, be, to lose its, its power, it's going to be an interesting landscape uh, for a lot of Now, Mitch, you ways. sound a little bearish, so I'm going to take a bullish uh, point of view just for the heck of it. Um, I think I don't actually know what will happen. I sh for sure don't know what will happen to media rights, but I think that aggregating live viewers predictably for something like the NBA or like soccer 
where you've got two hour and 15 minute games, you know, brightly lit in our case, you know, indoors, uh, orange ball that you, you, know, you know, you can see. It's, a, um, it's, it's gone global. On your mobile, I was in Marrakesh, because I had an investment in Formula E. We had a race in Marrakesh. It's three in the morning, I'm watching our game I'm back here on a cell connection in Marrakesh with no interruption, no uh, freezing or whatever. It, you know, we probably lost, but that was the only problem. But you could see the game fine. It was, um, I think that advertising, you know, there was an earlier panel that said that the, the rates of digital ad, you know, the CRMs, uh, it was a guy from 538 said CRMs are Nate Silver are down, you know. So the advertising dollars aren't there. They're gonna they're going to live sports, and I think they'll be. I think revenue sharing of global streaming, you know, share that 50-50 or something with the leagues. That's going to end up being very serious dollars going forward. I, I hope think, you're right. You know, we've been watching and enjoying sports for 2,500 years in this world, and you know, the original Olympic Stadium, I think, was 40,000 people or something. That's in BC. You know, I, I, it's, it's going to be here, and people are going to pay to watch it because that's how we put the games on. And few, fewer than, I'll just add a couple, a couple of facts and stats in a, in a somewhat um, parallel perspective. That was a fact-laden presentation. <laughs> you just you have more facts. It. You have more just, facts, as usual. Um, if you could only drop it. Um, only, you know, <laughs> fewer than 1% of NBA fans will ever attend a game live. And so, and I, and I think, and I, I agree with Wick. Is that I, in Philly? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are sold out. I was there. Every game. Every game. Uh, okay. Fortunately. 120 straight, I think, so far. You're, I know you're on nine years or whatever it is. Um, so, um, so, you know, I think that you're having more players enter the market, which is really interesting. So if you look in the future at Amazon and Apple and YouTube and whoever else will Netflix come into the, the live sports market, I think that's interesting. I think the, the global nature of live sports is absolutely real. And I think the, the sports industry will move much more aggressively, much more efficiently, and much more smartly into a direct-to-consumer model, which will completely um, create a kind of a world of haves and have-nots, as we are no longer getting maybe a, a big rights check from an RSM. But if you fast forward 10 years from now, we're going to have to know who the Sixers fans are in our radius, and, and you could see a day where the NBA might say, go get Sixers fans around the world, or you could see a day where the NBA then takes all of our rights together and bundles them, and they become the experts in direct-to-consumer. But, but the world, it will be very different from, from what we see today in terms of, of rights and opportunity. And I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hard bull. I think this is going to be a, an incredible run for media rights over the next 15 years. I mean, in some ways, what you're talking about is kind of more like what's happening in England, which you'd actually have some experience with, where, the, where, where you know, the, the, the brands, the big brands at the top of the table essentially aggregate more of the TV revenue um, and use that money to reinvest and perpetuate, if any, you know, their, their, their dominance over the leagues. Um, I think we in American soccer are kind of in a slightly different position than you guys are in the NBA or, or the NHL, where your leagues are the premier leagues in the world. Mm -hmm. um, we, we're... You know, we're soundly beaten regularly by Liga MX, the Mexican League, even in the United States from a ratings perspective, um, and compete against the Premier League, the, the Bundesliga, um, League uh, Serie A in, in, in Spain, et cetera. So, you know, we're, we're fighting in some ways for relevance um, amongst the soccer audience here in the United States. And I think the live uh, in stadium, part of it ends up being almost more important for us, at least sort of initially, as we head toward our 2022 media deal. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's slight non sequitur, but related, is you know we're we're actually like we actually have um, Chinese-born nationals working for the 76ers, creating content in Mandarin every day. And you think about it, like we we have I think four and a half million followers on Weibo for the Sixers. Like it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Then you might say, well, that's not a great use of your time or effort. And I would say, oh, I think you're sadly mistaken. If you can be a top five team in China, how might that increase the value of your franchise 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. And we think as the world continues to shrink, like our ability to get inside and actually tell stories through content will become even more important. I think it's all interrelated. And, and it's going to be a fascinating run. So, so as... The world gets smaller and we have globalization. You have fans around the world that you are able to touch. How does that change your perspective of getting people through the front door into your venues to experience the live event, to be there, to be part of the fabric of that city that day in the Boston Garden or in, yeah. in your facility? I mean, we had a 
really senior NBA official in at our game uh, Saturday night, wrote, you know, a nail biter game and everything else. And, and they wrote to me, I actually, you know, I could not believe the atmosphere in there. You can't replicate that anywhere else mm -hmm. um, than at the live event. You can represent, replicate in other cities, but you can't replicate that live experience. And, and we, we are social people, and we like, you know, coronavirus aside and everything else, and that's a tragedy that's unfolding, so we won't make any light of it. It's, it's sad and worrisome, but, but in general, social beings love to be together and share that. You just uplift, as Scott said, uplift it all to another level when you're cheering for your team and uh, agonizing, over wins, agonizing over defeats occasionally. It, it's everything for us. I mean, we, we, we built an, a gorgeous uh, soccer-specific stadium in downtown, you know, south, right next to the, to the Coliseum on the USC campus, uh, accessible by public transportation, um, 23,000 seats, super modern, super beautiful. Um, and we've really invested in the fan experience in stadium because it's really our best marketing that we can do um, at this stage. And, um, and, and it's an it, we, we're known as having, for having one of the great atmospheres in the league uh, with a passionate group of fans who just sing for 90 minutes uh, every home game. So it's, it's, it's a fantastic experience and it's essential to our branding. Scott's writing that must sing. <laughs> Actually, Daryl came Nobody to, wants to hear me sing. I brought Daryl to one of our matches and he was filming the, 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 the supporter section and, and texting totally back to the Rockets and saying, we need this. That's like the premiership. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it is wonderful, and, and that, that experience at home is something that I think is impossible to replicate, although we're going to have to try, because to grow our business, and you think about next gen, and how you could actually, I don't, you know, I'm sure some of you have seen, seen some of the 3D or some of the experiential 4D type um, tests around what it might look like. If you could replicate what it's like to sit in Wix seats in the front row, um, I think that's pretty special. And, and when you talk about kind of replicating that, um, and, it, and it goes beyond putting on those crazy headsets, but if you can actually do it sitting in front of a television, I think that'll transform the experience going forward. And, and again, I need to go back to the, to the business side of it, but, but then it opens up kind of more, more D2C. And, and to, to make matters worse or different in terms of how we're doing our business now, you know, I'd, I'd ask everybody in the audience, when's the last time you bought something over the phone? And when's the last time you bought something over the phone when somebody called you from a number you didn't recognize? Like, that's the basis of our business right now. And so, you know, as we kind of transition to a D to C marketing machine, we're going to have to do everything differently. And so, or we can, we can stand pat and, 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 and ostrich it out and hope nothing changes. And, and we spend a lot of time thinking about what tomorrow looks like. And I think tomorrow looks like the opportunity to, on your same phone in Marrakesh, wherever that is, that, that you're, you're looking at that game as if you're sitting in your seat. I think that'd be an incredible, incredibly different vantage point or experience. Mm -hmm. In fact, like if you go to spend some time in China and you're taking a game in on Tencent, they absolutely understand um, how to optimize a viewer experience. So it's, it's a, a far better experience than you have here in the US. And to make matters, take matters one step further, Alibaba, then gives you the opportunity to actually go content to commerce right away. So I, I think if you, you spend time in China on Tencent and Alibaba, you'll actually see a lot of the future of what experience a game looks like, what will look like here in the next 10 years. I agree with that, by the way. What, what role is gambling going to play in the future of, of either your sport or sports in general or, or in the stadium itself with, with the prop bets? And, and you know, Amy Latimer was here from the Garden earlier this morning talking about the ability to, you know, you're sitting at your seat and betting on that free throw that's about to go up. How's that going to change the experience? I mean, I'm, I'm bullish on gambling in general, and, and, I, and it just seems like something people want to do, and so it's really hard to, 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 to sort of think about why it wouldn't be successful given just how much fun it is and how kind of additive it can be in, in, if, if, if managed properly and, and you know, if, if, it, if it doesn't become sort of a psychosis. Um, it, to the to the to the experience, the, particularly for you know games amongst teams that you're not supporting, where it gives you something to kind of you know to participate in, gives you an engagement vehicle for that particular match. Um, how it's going to work, I, I'm I don't think I'm sophisticated enough to really comment on, but I, I defer to these guys. I've been out to Vegas. I went to a, a place where they set the lines 
play by play, pitch by pitch and basket by basket for NBA and Major League Baseball games that are going overseas to Asia and Europe to legal to uh, casinos over there and betting over there. And it's $20 an hour college students at night sitting there watching either a Celtics game or it was a Yankees game, you know, and pitch by pitch or bat, at bat by at bat changing the odds on the game and what's happening. And it's sort of done grassroots, but it's very compelling and it is the future. I'm very bullish on gambling and also worried about it. It's got to be controlled and contained, but it's happening anyway. We might as well bring it out in the open and help it drive, um, you know, our engagement of our fans with our product. I'm behind Adam on that one. Um, I want to slowly turn to some of the questions from the audience because we're starting to, to, to get some in here. But, but one of the questions I have, and it's part of a, a question here from, from the audience, is what sport are you sort of paying attention to that you think that everyone should be watching? There's innovations, things that you want to um, steal from. What is it that, what, what's sort of that sport out there that, that really captivates your attention? I think for us in, in MLS and, and and for me in particular, it's the NBA. I mean, I think the NBA has just done an amazing job on the innovation front uh, over the last decade. Uh, again, the international expansion, the internationalization of the players in the league, uh, how they've handled television, how they've handled social media. Um, I think it's, it's a model for, for the rest of, of sports. And so we, we often look to, to the NBA for inspiration. Scott, I like startup leagues. Um, <clears throat> I'm just always intrigued by, uh, by a new take on, on an old idea. So the XFL is interesting to me. Um, I think some of the technological and rule enhancements will change the NFL, I think, over time. Um, I think Paul Rabel's lacrosse league, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking, mm -hmm. interested in. I think they're doing some good and smart business. Um, you're you're inv invested in Formula E, right? Formula E was... Formula E yeah. is, I think, really yeah. interesting. Um, um, so, so I, I, I like, man, I'm, I'm kind of a nerd. Like, I, I love going into and, and, and studying and speaking to the founders and understanding how, what their vision looks like and, and how they see the world and, um, and the opportunity to, to take some of those, the incredible innovations they have, being unencumbered with the box and ceilings that we put on ourselves. Formula well, E, thanks for the mention. That's an no amazing founder. Out. Yeah, that was really good of you. Um, <laughs> I, I would, I, you know, I probably would have said the Premier League because they've, they've done the best by far at getting their rights global and engaging their That's fans right. with, and their fans are singing. And they may well have Falconers, I'm not sure, but um, <laughs> it seems like they're ahead of the game in many things and uh, in engagement. I was over at Liverpool's opening match this year. They were celebrating the European Championship, the uh, Champions Cup uh, that they had won over the summer. And just being, being there in Liverpool and seeing at Anfield and seeing what was going on over there, I'm just impressed. It's in a way the most traditional of sports, but it's also forward thinking in some ways. And so I probably would have said that one. We just bought a franchise in the G League though. I think the G League, just a shout out to the G League, it's the second best basketball league in the world. Um, and those franchises are uh, now just generally owned by NBA clubs. But if it ever opened up, I think it would be a huge opportunity. It's, gonna, it's going straight north, I think. Uh, Canada, or do you mean? Straight north. <laughs> well, at least you know that Canada's north. I mean, you're... Thank you. I got a, I got a question from the audience. Um, how do you think women's sports franchises can increase their viewership and, and profitability? Advice, recommendations? I, the N, NWSL seems like it's off to a pretty good start. I, I think we're, you know, we're looking at uh, maybe doing something in Los Angeles. I know uh, Mia Hamm... One of our owners has been quite vocal about that in, in terms of us putting pressure on us to potentially bring a team to Los Angeles. Uh, what's happening in Portland is pretty remarkable and, and it's very encouraging as far as, as, far as we can tell. Um, I think it's, you know, w with, a, with a good stadium infrastructure and a good fan base already in place, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, I don't know as much about the media side, about, the, about viewership, um, and, and I don't know what the numbers really look like. I haven't studied them that carefully, but. Uh, it, again, that's going to always be an important component of it because so much of the of the revenue ends up being dependent on those media deals, and so I think that's you know that that's that's going to be the, the driver. I think. Well, my sister was a four-time All-American tennis player and then played all the Grand Slams. Was rated right, right in the top 50 in tennis. She crushed me, by the way, and she's five years younger. Um, still stings a little, but to her credit, um, <laughs> my daughter was a high school national champion in rowing. I'm all about 
uh, the concept. And I think that what has worked for us at the Celtics is from the beginning telling the stories of the players and trying to have the fans engage with the team. Whether we win or lose, they're watching and becoming familiar with our players on and off the court as people and as driven young people trying to do the right thing, make a way for themselves and affect other people positively, as Scott alluded to. And I think the storytelling, and I learned a lot about the uh, US women's soccer team mm -hmm. uh, in their championship run and um, just learned more about them, just only remotely through the media, but as people and as people of character and strength. And so I think the more we learn about any group of athletes, regardless of gender, the more engaged generally fans and media are. And so it's just telling those stories and getting them out there is a, is a first step or a starting point. Yeah, it's a, it's a really hard question. Um, <clears throat> and I've spent some time in uh, professional women's sports. Um, one was with the New York Liberty when I was at uh, Madison Square Garden. And then the Riveters is a professional hockey team, actually won the, won the cup. Um, and, um, and then I worked within the WNBA when I was at the NBA. And, and I can tell you, it's, it's hard. Like it, and I, I would say that's the case for any startup league, um, men's or women's. Um, and I think WIC is onto something with storytelling. Um, but um, but I, I don't have the answer. I, I certainly wish I did. I, I can tell you, like, I, I have a love for the WNBA. Um, I think our new commissioner is, uh, is, mm -hmm. is the right person at the right time to lift the league up. Um, but, um, but we don't have a team in Philadelphia. We don't own our own arena. Um, I think the NHL will come up with some kind of formulation um, with, with women's hockey at some point, which we'd love to be interested in, engaged in again once a league you know, surfaces. Uh, but it's a, it's a very tough business. I think storytelling is a, a good tip. Um, I think um, having some of the, the more famous athletes like Amiya Ham mm -hmm. kind of take, take to the forefront is really helpful. Um, but this is um, to start, just like the NBA was um, 70 some odd years ago, and the NHL was 100 years ago. It starts grassroots, and you have to do the grassroots work, and you have to be really comfortable barnstorming because that's what teams did. When I talk to, to, he goes by Bill Cunningham now, but the great Billy Cunningham, he talks about um, being on the road, only having one jersey, and washing the jersey in the sink, and hanging it after a game onto his, uh, his bathtub. And you think, like, this is one of the greatest players in the world. We, can you imagine Joel Embiid going back to his hotel room? Sharing a room, by the way, because that's what they did. They shared a room on the road, and then washing it. When I came in, Red Auerbach, we brought him back as team president, the great Red Auerbach, maybe the greatest coach of all time in any sport. And he had been the coach and the general manager. And he said, Wick, I got a couple things to tell you. I mean, you're, just, you know, you're 41 years old. You're coming here. Let me give you some advice. He's, I'm like, I'm all ears. He said, you don't need any assistant coaches. Just one coach is plenty. <laughs> he said. Uh, How many he, do you have now? And he was telling like nine <laughs> or 10. And, and then he said, uh, by the way, 99% of what he said was, you know, of course, brilliant and couldn't be replicated. But, <clears throat> but then he would talk, they would, uh, he and Heinsohn would sit around telling stories about how Red was driving the bus or the van, and they were in Moscow. You know, he had taken them to Moscow, barnstorming to make, for everybody to make more money in the summer. Right. Red is in Moscow, driving to the wrong side of the road, you know, right. without a license, you know. Right. And, and, I, and I think and that's they, right. Red got arrested and put in jail, and the team didn't bail him out for three hours just for a keep prank. Keep him in there. You know, but it was like only Red and, oh, only, and the only, team. That was oh, it. Only it was Red, very but, simple back then. But in, in, in some of these startup leagues, I think, you know, we come in and, and we have a vision or a version that it's going to be... Yeah. 70 years ahead when, when we actually have to go and, you know, I have uh, some somewhat infamous expression at, at work that people don't love to hear, but I said, let's do the work. And, and sometimes you have to do the work and it takes time and patience and money and commitment. And, and over time, um, great content will find a home and, and great content will find paying viewers. And I think the content's really good. You could run for president. And Thank you. Say, let's do the work. I'm just <laughs> laughing because 20 years in, like, you know, we're still sharing rooms. We're still, you know, we just, the last CBA, we just negotiated our way out of the less spendy owners wanting to keep a cap on charter legs. We, last year, we were limited to four charter legs in a 34-game season. Legs, wow. not, not, not round trips. Right, 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 um, but, but think of how far you've come in 20 years. Yeah, no, it's, it's a real business with huge valuations. I, I get it, but, but I'm just saying, like, we're not as far removed from that Red Auerbach lecture than... Oh, he said also... <laughs> You sit in first class and the players sit in coach. 
I'm going to maybe tell him that now, since in his absence, we've, they're chartering now. I, mm -hmm. I didn't want to break it to him. Um, Who's the best? That's a tough act to follow. Well, 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 Tom, I am too. I'm Tom. Excellent. Let's tell more Red Auerbach stories. Right, right, right. Um, all of you are, are obviously successful leaders. I'm always fascinated by the biggest failure that you've had and how you got back up, right? Because it's, it's fail eight times, get up nine. Right? Is, there, is there advice that you can give just in general about some sort of knock that you took and how are you able to, to get back up in this incredibly competitive landscape? I mean, I've made so many mistakes, it's hard to narrow it down to one. Maybe we could choose one for you. And... <laughs> I've never seen him make a mistake. Oh, there's so many. Uh, one time I, I, I ran, Confetti. I was running a comp. <laughs> Yeah, they're a lot public too. There's some public ones that are really bad, but um, but we're, some that we're are playing little... a, a playoff game in Philly, and they made a basket, I think, to tie the score, or it was a to three win it. to win it, it and corner. then it became a two. The confetti had already come down. We're brushing confetti out of our yeah, yeah, and, I, and we're going to overtime. Then we lose, <laughs> which was awesome. It was awesome. It was good fun. I thought Wick handled that. He handled it really well. I'm glad he I'll hasn't really... I'll never forget it. One of my day. favorite no, days of all It's good that time. you don't have that grudge. I will say, um, I, I have, I have a, a hair. So I, was, I, ran, I had an a early stage media company called Hoops TV. Uh, I was in my early 30s and thought I, had, I knew everything, which was, was just awesome. Um, and I ran that straight into the ground. I'd raised about $15 million, had some great partners, incredible investors, and, um, and kind of was, uh, was kind of believing the... the um, the, the bubble as it burst on my head. Um, and, and I was um, kind of out of work, out of luck, out of money, um, had let go of the 50 some odd employees that I had. Oh, brutal. Um, and one was my brother, which was good. Some were my best friends. Um, and then I spent a month kind of negotiating all, out the contracts, and I, I, it was, which was a, ended up being a, a great experience for, for future band negotiations. Um, but it was essentially like, I'll give you 70 cents on the dollar now, tomorrow it's going to be 50, the other day it's 20, and then it's going to be in a filing cabinet somewhere. So I went through that kind of wind down exercise. And, um, but the big lesson for me was, um, I was I was in a shell and not doing very well. And, and uh, my, my wife kind of fished me out, if you will. Kind of stayed, supported, loved, kind of kept me kind of going until I was ready to get back on my feet. And so my big advice is, 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 is find a, a partner that is uh, your friend, your biggest supporter, um, your champion, and someone who's strong as a rock. We don't have enough time to talk about my failures. Um, <laughs> man, I was, a, I was a, an entrepreneur for a decade before I was a venture capital, an early stage venture capitalist, and those two things are not areas where like ubiquitous success is, free, is a frequent result. So. I mean, I've had, I've just had tons of things that were that I that I had enormous faith in and belief in, and enormous personal investment in, go to zero, and it's it's a I think it's an incredible life lesson, and it's it's something that's made me sort of better in all in all ways in business. I think one of the one of the problems that we've had in the valley over the last decade is it's been up and to the right since the 2008. Uh, financial crisis, and there are young entrepreneurs out there who've never experienced failure. And it's gonna, it just, it, it, it leads to a lack of resilience that I think is quite dangerous. I've experienced uh, plenty of mistakes and failures that I've made and caused, and I think most of the ones that come to mind right away are in the investment sphere. And I have a rule of only trying to back entrepreneurs that I would work for that I would theoretically bring home to mom and dad or my wife and say this is my new boss you know if I were in the mode of looking for a job and I think I've made that mistake a couple of times of saying well this is a great business plan this is a hot market this person is right for the company but it probably failed that test um, and I but anyway there you know good people all around and just sad outcomes but uh, you know not undefeated in business uh, investing for sure can I just share one more? I literally have 100, but I think this one's a good lesson. So I, I'm, I'm 24 years old, and I just get named director of sales for the Philadelphia Eagles. I think I've made it, you know? <laughs> and uh, at the time, the, this is a football team, NFL. We had three people in sales and marketing, if you can imagine that. Like, that's how small these businesses were back then. This is mid-'90s. And, um, and uh, I, I got asked to be on a, an, a local access television show. 
So like now I've really made it. Like I might even call mom and tell her I'm almost famous. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like local access, like That's Temple awesome. University, right? So I, I go on and it's like stools set up in like a terrible like apartment. You know, the guy's like covering up his, his studio apartment with like a sheet so I can see. It's like Wayne's it. World. It was worse. Yeah. And, uh, and the guy kept asking me, so if, so if you don't get a new stadium, you're going to have to leave, right? I'm like, no, we love the city. Philadelphia's great. So I'm speaking way out of school. I mean, there's no way a 24-year-old kid should be speaking on behalf of the organization. But, you know, I, I did know it all. And uh, he said, I know, but for Jeffrey Lurie, he just came in and bought this team. Like, obviously, he's not going to stay if we get to stay in Veterans Stadium. I said, no, 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 of course. The third time, he asked me. So, but, but if nothing were to happen, just suppose, like hypothetically, if nothing were to happen, um, you'd have to leave. And I say, well, I guess if it would never happen, of course, we'd have to leave. Back page of the paper that day. Oh, oh. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Lurie sends henchmen to deliver a message. That was almost Excellent. the end of an illustrious career. <laughs> All right, uh, time is short, so I've got a couple of questions. We're gonna, we're gonna go quickly. I, I really like this one from the audience. I think it's an opportunity to... Um, right, lightning round. To, lightning round. This, this is great, though. Um, what charity is it that you'd like to promote really quickly that, that matters to you? Mitch. Start down there. It's gonna take me a second to think about it. Mass Ioneer, we're the leading blindness and deafness research center in the world. My son is blind. I've been the chairman of Mass Ioneer for 11 years. We are coming up on $250 million raised to fight blindness and deafness, and we'd appreciate any help. Scott. This is gonna sound self-serving, but the uh, Sixers Youth Foundation, I just love it. Uh, we do stuff for both the Devils and Sixers. Um, they're great causes. We, all, we focus on Middle school, which is terrible and treacherous. If you have any middle school children, I'm sorry. It's middle school kids and leveraging sports to help them through education and leadership. And, uh, I, I just say on, on, on the football side, the LAFC Foundation is a tremendous charity and is doing building soccer uh, fields for kids in South LA and underprivileged neighborhoods and investing in the sport all around the city. And uh, on, on the, the more socially aware side, I would say, um, any kind of autism research uh, at this point, I think, is, is, is very, it's very underfunded and very, very in need of, of, of support. I feel like we're doing a telethon up here, but give, give, give. Um, <laughs> real quick, what is the hot topic going to be at next year's Sloan Conference? What's that one thing that, that Jess and Daryl are going to spend a lot of time thinking about? We've got to have a panel on this for the first time. Mitch? Geez, I hope it's not the, the coronavirus, that's for sure. I hope it's not the, 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 that, w that we can't have games with live audiences for the rest of, the se for the rest of these seasons. But, uh, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I would say that I'm, I'm happy to see more soccer here. I think women's sports needs to be here a little bit more, more well represented. Scott? I think it's going to be the recovery. I think we're going to have a tumultuous time in the markets. And I think next year we're going to be talking about the great recovery. Wick? Probably something to do with media and, you know, direct to consumer, like Scott said. Excellent. Um, quickly, in the last 90 seconds, we've got one or two traits for those who are looking to break into sports. What is it that they need to persevere to get themselves in the door? I think you have to demonstrate that you have competed at the very highest level of something, it doesn't have to be sports, but you're uh, someone that has pushed yourself to beyond a limit, the way we ask our athletes and frankly our fans to do. So somebody, you, not just going down the middle, going 55 miles an hour all the time, you gotta know how to go 100. Scott? Confidence and persistence. Yeah, I'd say, like, I'd share with Wick a commitment to excellence at, at something, regard, like whether, whether it's sports or math or whatever, um, on the one hand, and, and something unique that you can bring to the party. It's like we, we you know, the, it, it, it's some, somebody with a real personality or a real specialty that really stands out. Wonderful. On behalf of MIT, the students, thank you to Mitch, thank Scott, you, and Wick. Thanks, Warren. Great job. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.